Allen, Bill, is one of the very best authors and speakers on the topic of civic education and related themes that we could possibly have addressed us here at BYU. Civic education presupposes the joining together of the formation of the citizen on the one hand with that of the formation of the human being as such. And no one has thought more carefully or expressed himself more eloquently on the vital questions of what makes a good citizen and what makes a good human being than Professor Allen. No one uh, has done more to bring to light, moreover, the concept of self-government as a unifying concept between the good human being and the good citizen. Professor Allen is Emeritus Professor of Political Philosophy and also a Dean of the James Madison College at Michigan State University. James Madison College, by the way, is a liberal arts college nested within a large state university. An intriguing idea, if you don't mind my saying so. Uh, Bill is currently visiting professor at the University of Colorado, where he is teaching a course on liberalism and its critics. To give you an idea of Bill's intellectual approach, the course on liberalism begins with Plato. <laughs> Bill was educated notably uh, at Pepperdine University, where he was taught by uh, a late friend of a number of us here, Richard Vetterly and at Claremont Graduate School, where he was taught by two giants of political philosophy, names that if you don't know, I recommend them to you, Harry Jaffa and Leo Strauss. Uh, Bill has been a visiting scholar or fellow at Villanova University uh, and in the James Madison Program on American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. He has published extensively, I won't list the uh, titles, publishers, etc., but he has published extensively books as well as articles on authors and themes in political philosophy, especially in relation to the American founding, including works on George Washington, on Montesquieu, on the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And he has also published with his daughter, Carol M. Allen, who is now, let me add, on the faculty of Harvard University, a book entitled Habits of Mind, Fostering Access and Excellence in Higher Education. In the realm of public service, let me mention that uh, Bill has served on the Nas National Council of the Humanities and as a chair and member of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, as a concluding personal note, let me say that I've, uh, I've known Bill and admired him for decades and that I've spent much of this day already with him and have already drawn out some indications of his remarks tonight. Uh, for that reason, I am all the more eager to hear just what he has to say regarding the character of freedom. Please join me in welcoming William B. Allen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful to you. As the day has gone on, Ralph's introductions have become more elaborate. <laughs> and, I, and I'm very grateful for them. But, but I must correct one thing, not because it's a, any egregious fault on Ralph's part. It's actually a quite natural mistake to make. But because in the context, I was giving a presentation last week uh, down in Boulder where someone uh, referred to me and my relationship to my sister, Danielle Allen, uh, who was who who's a very famous uh, scholar and author, and is actually my daughter, not my sister. <laughs> I suppose I should have been somewhat complimented by that. On the other hand, uh, my wife, Carol, who is my co-author <laughs> of Habits of Mine, is of age, I want to assure you. <laughs> but but the, all that puts me in mind, on that occasion last week, the uh, host asked me to give some quirky fact of mine that could be shared with the audience that would put everyone at ease. And I have trouble thinking of quirky facts in my life as someone who began reading at an early age and has spent his entire life in education 
you can imagine it's not been a very exciting life. Uh, nevertheless, I, I said, well, you can tell them that I used to date Maureen Reagan. And if that will put them at ease, then fine, I will go on from there. <laughs> so I'm here tonight, despite a colorful past, to speak to you about character and to speak in particular about national character and character, the character of freedom itself. And I'm going to speak for not a terribly long time, I trust, so that we have good opportunity for conversation as well. But I do want to speak very specifically, so I'm going to ask you to bear with me as I work through an argument which can be in some ways somewhat intricate. But I think it's important, and I, I really do want you to follow along with the argument. So uh, I make the statement that the arc of justice runs unbendingly through personal and national character. The arc of justice runs through, develops from personal and national character. That observation is the foundation of George Washington's consistent words and deeds throughout the American Revolution and founding. In fact, <coughs> careful attention to Washington's words and deeds reveals a strikingly close parallel between the course or track of his mortal existence and the existence of the United States as a coherent political entity from its birth to the promulgation of the Emancipation Proclamation, which some people think of as the terminal moment of the regime Washington founded, and others as a narrow escape of a mortal injury. Since turnabout is fair play, it is only fair to take at his word the man who first insisted upon the establishment of a national character and apply the stringencies of his own, to his own life. So the point of this talk is not to put Washington to the test, however. It is rather to draw forth from the example of Washington principles by which to assess character-forming statesmanship. For at length, we must inquire whether the course or track of the nation's existence has been unbending since Washington set it on its path, or rather, whether it has run on two or more tracks since that time. And in the event that the latter seems at all likely, then it will also be pertinent to inquire whether some other Washington, or many Washingtons, exerted an influence like unto that Washington exercised. Then finally, it will be fitting to judge whether the state attained in the fullness of time is one that conforms to the standards at the outset, enunciated by Washington in particular. We will show that Franklin Delano Roosevelt has an influence of dimensions every bit as great as Washington's, though regrettably to ill effect. So to start out, beginning with the initial standard, we could do worse than to recover Washington's observation that those persons chosen to administer the proposed Constitution, and I quote, will have wisdom to discern the influence which their example as rulers and legislators may have on the body of the people and will have virtue enough to pursue that line of conduct which will most conduce to the happiness of their country. As the first transactions of a nation, like those of an individual upon his first entrance into life, make the deepest impression and ought to form the leading traits in its character, they will undoubtedly pursue those measures which will best tend to the restoration of public and private faith and, in consequence, promote our national respectability and individual welfare. In that succinct summation, we find the elaboration of what Washington intended in his self-described political legacy when he proclaimed that we have a national character to establish. The fact that he referred to in that formulation as much to the character of the citizens as the reputation of the nation in the world is incontestable. Indeed, it would be appropriate to say that while he did not diminish the significance of national reputation on the world stage, 
His formulation even more emphatically aimed at the expression of a collective tone derived from the individual attainments of the citizens. Thus, the national character to be established was nothing less than the shaping of distinctive manners and mores among the citizens as a necessary incident of Republican self-government. Let's inquire what are those distinctive manners and mores by considering the requisites of Republican citizenship. And we may seek their illumination in the model that Washington offered through his own life and character. But to place this in context, I want to contrast two statements, one from Thomas Hobbes, the philosopher, from his Leviathan, which reads as follows. Nothing can be unjust in the state of nature. The notions of right and wrong, justice and injustice have there no place. Where there is no common power, there is no law. Where no law, no justice. And then George Washington, who makes this observation. Law can never make just, which is in its nature unjust. In that formulation, we see Washington, as it were, deliberately responding to uh, Thomas Hobbes, and of course, denying the truth of Hobbes' claim. And that puts us in mind that the claim that the founding of the United States was centered in a rationalistic individualism without any moral standards, subject to a complete relativism of morals and complete positivism with regard to right and wrong, or as Hobbes also put it, there's no such thing as a summum bonum, an ultimate good, is precisely what is in contest between George Washington and those who are reputed to be the theoretical authors of the modern experiment in liberty. And what I propose to suggest to you tonight is that Washington's authority ought to prevail over the authority of the political philosophers who depart from what Washington taught. So let's start at the beginning. I said Washington declared in 1783 that we have a national character to establish. In making that declaration, George Washington established certain principles which he repeated throughout his career. And those principles amount to a definition of what is expected in Republican self-government. He made two further observations in the 1783 political legacy in which he said we have a national character to establish. The one observation was that we have the special blessing of no longer living in the age of ignorance and superstition. We benefit from the age of enlightenment. So in that degree, he was sensible and sensitive to whatever progresses in human understanding had been acquired through the era of the Enlightenment. The second statement he made was that we have it in our power to reap the fruits of this opportunity to such a degree that if we fail, there will be none to blame but ourselves. Remember, this comes at the time when the war is over. The peace treaty has been finally concluded and the United States is recognized as an independent society by Great Britain. So Washington emphasized that it had been placed in the hands of the people of the United States to acquire a national character suited to the task of realizing the promise of self-government. And they could not blame any rulers or any social class or any conditions of the universe on a failure to do so, since everything had been staked on the gamble that they were capable of ruling themselves. Now, Washington continued that argument over the course of the succeeding years after 1783, as the nation moved through the deep crisis in the years between the end of the war and the writing of the Constitution, a crisis of government failure under the Articles of Confederation. He constantly reiterated the necessity for his countrymen to take in hand the task of 
ending political imbecility and reshaping the Constitution of the United States to fit the needs of the hour. He organized what one political philosopher or political scientist in the 1960s called a reform caucus that worked consistently to pursue the idea ultimately of a political convention, a constitutional convention that would reshape the instruments of power in the United States. But those instruments of power have to be understood, Washington emphatically repeated, as the power of the people, once called upon by Trumbull to exercise his influence during the Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts, Washington replied, influence is no government. Give us a regular government and regular laws, and let's see how they work. And those, of course, are expected to be laws founded in the consent of the people and operated through the people's representatives legitimately established. But at the heart of this entire regime, as Washington laid it out, were a couple of simple principles, which simple principles I want to put on the table for you tonight in order that you may use them as an instrument with which to compare what we have seen since that time. The one principle is that the purpose of establishing this national character is to foster a society that will indeed develop, encourage, and preserve the potential of the best. That to get the best out of people is the objective. And to call them, to summon them, to give their best is part of the program that Washington put on the table. And in the course of arguing that we're summoning the best from the citizens of the country, Washington also made clear that we are going to, of course, provide care for the least. He did this again in 1783 at the close of the war when he gave his final general orders to the troops. And he said they had won a victory which committed them to building a society that would be an asylum for the poor and oppressed of every nation and religion. And that encyclopedic Catholic appeal that he made enunciated to the entire army and therefore the entire country was meant to set the tone for what would be accomplished in the United States. I published a book which was entitled George Washington, America's First Progressive. I received a considerable uh, fire for daring to call George Washington a progressive, since in some quarters that is a term that exudes a bad odor. Uh, but I reminded people that George Washington is the first person in the history of the country who referred to himself as a progressive. And the fact that some came along a hundred years later and completely corrupted what he meant by that term doesn't change the fact that it had meaning when he used it. And the meaning that he had is a meaning that he consistently repeated. It is to say it was a matter of refinement in morals and manners and amelioration of human circumstances. Washington was as strong an advocate of the principles of the modern advance commercially and economically as anyone else, but at the same time he was not captured by the narrow-minded, blinded view of materialism that otherwise characterized defenses of the emerging industrial order. He could see the possibility both of enhancing material circumstances in the society and also enhancing freedom. And indeed, he went so far as to believe that it is through enhancing freedom, ultimately, that one would enhance the material circumstances and therefore the well-being of all the participants in the society. So the national character that he was talking about was a character shaped by private virtue as he said in the first inaugural address, shaped by probity, he was famous for the expression, honesty is the best policy, among others, and of course, famous 
for attentiveness to duty, which he encouraged the people to. He said in his farewell address in 1796, it is utter folly to think that one can maintain a decent society without the influence of religion. So across the board, George Washington spoke of the necessity of developing the elements of personal character as part and parcel of the elaboration of national character. And the relationship between the two was this. The national character would be founded in the consistent performance of good and decent deeds by the citizens of the country. How did he underscore that? He contrasted the United States in his farewell address in 1796 with princedoms, monarchies, and other societies where those who were in command had the perfect liberty to pursue a Machiavellian line of policy, by which we mean to say they could say one thing and do another, and it would cost them nothing. Inconstancy was to them an advantage, not a disadvantage. Washington explained that in a society run on the foundation of public opinion, you can't change on a dime, because public opinion can't change on a dime. You must therefore follow, he said, the consistent policy of justice in dealing with others in order to carry public opinion with you and to sustain the healthiest opinion in the community. So Washington gave direct testimony to the overriding importance of both developing clear-sighted and fairly formulated public policies sustained by public opinion and at the same time recognizing that the government's legitimacy and authority stood upon that public opinion. Not just the consent at the outset of the government, but the continuing consent through the course of the government. To be sure, there were controversies. He differed with James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, who thought that public opinion ought to govern the society on a basis that was not tied to representation, i.e., once you elect a government, Washington maintained, along with Alexander Hamilton, that is the expression of public opinion. And it's held accountable with recourse to subsequent elections. And therefore, those who are elected have the obligation, the duty, to inform the public completely. It was George Washington who most of all pushed the demand in the first government for the free transmission of the press through the post office in the United States. We like to think the free press means the press can get away with murder. What it actually meant was it was to be made available free <laughs> to the people. So Washington said they would always be well informed. So, so that for Washington, this element of democratic practice was fundamental to sustain the character building elements of society, which he had emphasized. And again, it reverts to the promise of the society. He said in a letter to the German congregation in New York, again in 1783, at the end of the war, the motive that induced him to the field was civil and religious liberty. So that for George Washington, there were numerous professions over the course of his life, all of which build towards a certain point, a certain climax, as it were, that is critical in understanding what the United States was about. And that climax was an expectation of a fundamentally decent people, of people who practice their religious convictions openly and freely without inhibition by the state, who maintain a constant monitoring over the political institutions of society, who were themselves, as it were, the watchmen, rather than being watched by the state, such that political power would remain limited, and in the context of that limited power, would secure the free exercise of rights of conscience, and therefore constraints on the power of government, out of which would emerge the prosperity of the society, and the mutual engagement between those who were in the best positions to contribute to the overall well-being and those who were necessarily by circumstances consigned to becoming beneficiaries or patients. As I, the way I like to put it is to say, Washington understood 
that a society is best structured in which those who are capable of being effective agents have the greatest freedom to pursue their agency, and those who are not capable of being effective agents will be the beneficiaries of the great productivity that is produced by effective agents. And it's con continuing the balance between those things that produces a successful society. So that gives you a, a general portrait of George Washington, his teaching, and that in conformity with his life. But there might be one question you would want to raise, and I can't duck the question. You might want to ask, this Washington you're talking about, who is praising freedom, was an owner of slaves. So why should we take him seriously? Why shouldn't we just regard this as self-interested hypocrisy, the mouthing of mere rhetoric without moral substance? And the answer, I believe, is relatively straightforward. Everything Washington said, including an early letter of his at the outset of the revolution, when he compared the submission to British tyranny to being, to submitting oneself to an absolute arbitrary rule, the same as that that they had exercised in the colonies over the slaves, thereby making clear he was conscious of the existence of some degree of inconsistency between the defense of liberty on the part of the Americans while still holding slaves. But the question is, was that awareness, consciousness, part of a growing resolve to do something about the problem of slavery? Was he, in fact, growing out of the commitment to slavery? And the answer is yes, he was but he was growing out of that commitment to slavery. As he himself said in some of his correspondence, he had developed grave doubts about the propriety of this and indeed quickly came to see the utter injustice of it. But more importantly than that, as a gentleman uh, in the true sense of the word, who takes the obligations of prudent judgment, decision, and action seriously, he had to ponder carefully what to do. He pondered two things. One, encouraging legislative resolution, i.e. resolution by law, rather than by the guerrilla practices uh, of the question of slavery. And two, getting right himself on the question of slavery. Now you might think getting right himself means let your slaves go. That's typically the way it gets phrased in our time. But that's only phrased by people who don't stop to think, as practical human beings, how to actually act in any given circumstance, taking into account all the possible consequences. Washington was aware that simply saying to a slave, you are free to go, was not necessarily doing a favor to a slave. For the question immediately surges to the forefront, go where? <laughs> Do what? Live how? What education? Where's the society that's going to receive me? I don't know where you stole me from. How would I get back there? If I were to go all the way back there, who's going to pay for it? The whole host of practical questions that are not answered by people who give the easy response, abolish slavery. But to Washington, all of those questions did occur. And so he dedicated himself to building his estate to make it possible for him upon his death not only to free his slaves, but to provide for them. So they at least had a chance to survive in this world, and he provided both in terms of providing materially and making provision for the education of the young who would require some education in order to be able to do anything at all in a society that was at best hostile to their very presence. So that it is not a straightforward question, why didn't they do something about slavery? The people who were born into a slaveholding society, who often enough entered into slaveholding by way of ordinary birth, by inheritance, didn't necessarily have very easy paths to remove the difficulty from among them. Now I understand, saying that is not meant to be an excuse. And we know historically that it never became easy 
so that eventually it was only in the course of fighting a disastrous war that we were able to overcome it. But then it's also important to remember that that war was effectively a brother's war. It was not the war of racial extinction that Tocqueville had predicted, but it was a war between brothers over the moral question, ultimately, of slavery that brought an end to it. So that, as it turns out, the regime comes to an end, finally, the regime of slavery, that is to say, by confronting that internal contradiction. George Washington confronted that in 1795 in the Jay Treaty. The Jay Treaty was, of course, the resolution of the outstanding differences of Great Britain over the settlement of the Revolutionary War. The Jay Treaty was brought back by John Jay, who had been our emissary, with one singular omission that created a grave controversy. The singular omission was that it did not provide for the return of or compensation for slaves carried away by the British. Those who raised the greatest objections to the Jay Treaty and made it a vital element of political dispute in the country in 1795 and 1796 were most of all motivated by the slight with regard to slavery. But Washington nevertheless ratified the treaty and moreover, Washington deputed Alexander Hamilton to engage in the public debate about the treaty in the course of which Hamilton makes the argument, Washington never took public positions on anything in his political life. He got others to do it for him, apart from formal addresses, etc. But he had Hamilton explain, we did not do it because it violated moral and natural principles. So that at the outset, a tone was set in the administration of George Washington that leads ineluctably to the eventual conflict that removes slavery. So if you think of the struggle over slavery as something that took place over a long period of time and reached an eventual end, which was signaled in the beginning, then you can say there was not a contradiction in the hearts and minds of people like George Washington. There was only a contradiction in the society, which it took time to work through and to resolve. Now that's a long digression in the course of what I have to say, but it's an important digression because what you see there is the accomplishment of something on the basis of the character Washington was talking about. People committed to the life of freedom, people committed to independence, people committed to standing up for their rights and committed to the rule of law and with a sure conviction of their sufficiency as agents to provide for themselves. That's the character he was delineating and that he thought was necessary to make useful, uh, to, to derive useful fruit from American liberty, from the experience in self-government. And so ask, what became of it? Are we still such people as Washington had foretold and had sought to encourage? I answer you that we are not any longer those people. We are not those people because there have been changes in our self-understanding that are no longer compatible with the expectations that Washington had. At the superficial level, those changes are easy to see. We become, as a people, less religious. Even though there is still a fair amount of church going, there's also a fair amount of secularization in all the church going, let alone what happens outside the church. We've become, as a people, more tempted by the experience, or the, how shall I put this? We've become more tempted by the seduction of victimhood and the desire to be cared for rather than to produce. And there's a reason we have become that kind of people. For we have been taught, as surely as Washington taught us to be otherwise, that that was the only way to acquire freedom. I've indicated that Franklin Delano Roosevelt taught that, but he didn't teach it alone. 
The momentum was, of course, put in place early on in the 20th century, but it didn't really achieve its decisive influence until it was given articulation by Roosevelt. Beginning in 1932, in his campaign address at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, September the 23rd, 1932, where he gives a major address uh, which adopts the frontier thesis, the end of the frontier, meaning the end of freedom in America, the end of innovation, the end of development, a new and changed environment. Uh, that thesis, which he derived from some scholars, was a thesis that led him to emphasize in this particular address that equal opportunity was no longer at work in American society. And that little expression, equal opportunity is no longer going to work for us, was the beginning of the embrace of a completely different understanding of who we were. Now, it wasn't spelled out in as painful detail as it might have been in 1932. It was a, a rather egg-headed address he gave to the Commonwealth Club. And so the general public might have missed what he was saying, uh, particularly when it came to redefining fundamental rights, uh, through which he was effectively arguing that we can no longer count on our rights to provide our prosperity. The argument is we must generate prosperity in order to give opportunity to enjoy rights. That's what he was saying in the Commonwealth Club Address. In 1941, State of the Union, he summarizes it most succinctly in what he called the four freedoms. You recognize them, I'm sure, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, freedom from fear. But that was nicely poised and balanced. He said what was familiar, he said what was unfamiliar, and treated them as though they were the same. And we would easily glide from one to the other without recognizing there was a tension between them. But he knew there was a tension. He had already signaled that in 1932. And then in 1944, now, four times elected, heaven's sakes, surely he's as secure as possible. He gives a State of the Union in which he lays it all out very materially. Uh, I think I'll share that with you, if I can get it back up here uh, readily enough. Uh, it's, uh, these things disappear on me sometimes, and I'm not sure what I'm looking at always, but I'm trying. Uh, that's not it. Okay, well, I may not be able to find it as quickly as I thought I could. But at all events, I can tell you what it said, and you'll just have to trust me for it rather than going word for word. Uh, Roosevelt, in 1944, gives an address in which he says, in effect, you can't be free if you're hungry. You can't be free if you don't have a decent home. You can't be free if you're ill-clothed. In fact, freedom is of no use to you until your needs are provided. Now that argument turned our world upside down. It said, for example, that all those pioneers who settled into the Utah were people who couldn't do what they did as well as pioneers all across this country. It said that people don't have the capacity to be agents unless they're first made comfortable. They can accomplish things through resolve and determination and through the exercise of native abilities that come with simply being human. In fact, they are really not capable of self-government because freedom is of no use to them until you feed them. And so we entered a phase of our life where we began to talk that way quite systematically. We saw it repeated. In many cases, I'll give you many examples, I'm only going to cite a couple. 1965, 
Howard University, Lyndon Johnson repeats the very phrase, equal opportunity is not enough, which is another way of saying freedom won't work until the people who are in want are, have been satisfied. And of course, the operative question is, what use is freedom when you've got what you want, what you need? What's the point of freedom if you aren't going to get it for yourself? That's the operative question. But notice, we became increasingly persuaded of that way of thinking. So much so that Jimmy Carter, 1977, again extending the line of argument, because this was a portion of Roosevelt's argument as well, tells us that our Bill of Rights remains and will remain unfulfilled until the fundamental conditions of the United Nations Charter of Human Rights is fulfilled for the whole world. Not only must we feed ourselves in order to be free, we must feed mankind and produce material prosperity the world over before there can be true freedom. Again, I ask, what is the point of exercising freedom when you don't need or want anything? What's the freedom all about? Well, that question has never been answered. But we've only seen the problem become more entrenched as time has gone on. It has become more entrenched in the form of fostering victimhood, claims upon the society for provision rather than opportunities for production. And what I'm saying to you is that that has happened because of the forceful statesmanship of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who has changed the character of the people of this nation. Not their fundamental human nature, but persuaded them to think of themselves as different than what they could be. And in doing so, he has disarmed us, simply disarmed us. There's one example that highlights this most dramatically, and it arises in Martin Luther King, who in his wonderful career was as powerful an influence as Washington or Roosevelt, at least rhetorically, but who initially hearkened back to the inspiration of the founding. And so that 1963 address on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, which everyone remembers, was greatly celebrated because it seemed to be a call to character. The word character even formed part of the speech. And it seemed to invoke confidence that we could once again be a people of character who would judge one another by their character and not the color of their skin. But it didn't last. Five years later, by the time of the Poor People's Campaign, Chicago and Tennessee and elsewhere, and in the book, Chaos or Community, Where Do We Go From Here? King himself introduced victimhood and said we couldn't expect the people living in these conditions in Chicago to be anything better than what they are until they had been relieved of the deficiencies they suffered. Not until they were free to provide for themselves, mind you, but until someone else had provided for them. And by now, it has become the leitmotif of the progressive movement in the United States. That what community solidarity means, what it means to show concern for others, is to satisfy their material needs, rather than to summon from them their material exertions. I'm suggesting to you that we have completely turned the country around and that there are consequences to having done so which are not very encouraging. And we see those consequences in the fragmentation of the society, in the increasing division into separate identities, all opposing claims on the broad society. It is a disintegrating phenomenon which does not bode well for our continuing existence 
as an a pluribus unum. Statesmanship is powerful. Human beings have enormous capacities, but they are not self-activating. They require context in order to be activated, to take full advantage of them. And that's why throughout all human history, founders have been important. But founders, as Abraham Lincoln reminded in 1838, can win fame either by building up or tearing down. And when those who no longer see an opportunity to build up nevertheless seek fame, they do so by tearing down. I'm afraid we're living, my friends, in an era in which we're the subjects of the tearing down. Now, I don't want to end completely on a glum note. I want you to give reason, I want to give you reason to go home and look towards the future. And so I will say this in addition, and in a way I'm channeling, I suppose, George Washington at this moment. But whatever we do here and now will not be the last word. I just want you to remember that. Rome, 400 years. Sparta, 800 years. We, a little more than 200. All of them impressively long in human history. None, no society, ever, forever. But whether human societies last forever or not, the grounds of human existence are unchanging. There is a power greater than ourselves. That you can still count on. Take some questions anyway. <laughs> okay, very good. We should carry religious conviction into it. Uh, that means that if we accept the complete segregation yes, of uh, religious expression from education context for you. And then perhaps explain it a little more. When Washington and was approached by Louis Nicola, a colonel in his army, to consider accepting kingship in some of the deepest hours of the peril of the nation's history of the circumstances, Washington was outraged. And he wrote back a letter to Nicola that was so stinging. He says, what do you take me for? And by the time Nicola finished that letter, he was sunk into the deepest, a deep depression which, from which he never recovered for the rest of his life. He spent the rest of his life apologizing to Washington uh, because Washington simply thought this was insulting that anyone would imagine that he was doing what he was doing for the sake of wanting to assume authority over people when he was fighting for civil and religious liberty for Republican self-government. Now, put it in that context, and then you can see that what he's saying is, you are summoning the people to take responsibility for themselves. If you assume it is only in deference to my responsibility, to my fame or position, then you're assuming they're not capable of taking responsibility for themselves. That's what he means when he says influence is no government. The same reason he wouldn't be king. Yes. all structures of society in order to root out racism. Those are the only covert ways of waging war against the institutions of society. 
of your presentation. That was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Really fed my soul. Um, so, what is the best way, in your opinion, to help, especially our young people? Yeah. Well, but really, I, I, I'm not going to try to put words in his mouth because. Uh, trying to place him in our time is even more difficult than trying to place us in his time. <laughs> but, but I will say this, uh, you have rightly raised the question. Uh, I mentioned that he said in the first inaugural address that private morality is the foundation of our national happiness. I think he meant by that not just national happiness, but all of education as well, that it is founded in private morality so that we should go into it with religious conviction, not expect religious conviction to come out of it. We should carry religious conviction into it. Uh, that means that if we accept the complete segregation of religious expression from educational practice, we are essentially consenting to the destruction of the society to the extent it becomes pervasive. That's what it means, and I suspect that's what he might have seen. You can't cut off thinking. And so I would simply overwhelm people with additional material. And as they begin to see and are exposed to other things, they will see the shallowness of the indoctrination. And they will rescue themselves. Uh, an excellent question and an excellent answer. <laughs> <laughs> It is indeed an expression of progressive victimhood and virtue signaling that we talk that way. Institutions are not racist. The term racism is a description of a particular personal disposition and conduct. Persons can be racist. Persons can be un unjust. Institutions are not systematically anything but institutions. The persons who are, in effect, managing, manipulating, implementing the institutions bring their dispositions, characters, opinions, and affections into them. That doesn't make them systematically racist. That only makes them vulnerable to exploitation by people who are racist. But same systems are vulnerable to decency if the people who are managing them are decent. So these arguments that somehow we must overturn all the structures of society in order to root out racism, those are only covert ways of waging war against the institutions of society. Thank you so, so much. No substantive judgment to be made about what actually produces happiness. Well, this notion so, that we only have eccentric, subjective, individual desires that will make us happy is inconsistent really with the true notion of happiness. Um, and certainly inconsistent with what was thought at the founding. Yeah. Uh, the essay to which the gentleman referred is one that cites John Adams, who identifies happiness as moral performance, yeah. performance of excellence, and in with moral I, I wish I had a simple answer to that. I don't, because it's become so pervasive, it's really hard to cut through and, and show young people in particular the paths they can follow. But one of the things I have observed is that they are more subject to the sway of victimhood in proportion as they are less exposed in general to worthy works. And so introducing them to primary sources and to good literature, I think, is one of the best things you can do. Uh, the human mind is an incredible gift that no matter how much you propagandize or indoctrinate, unless you can isolate it from further exposure, you can't cut off thinking. And so I would simply overwhelm people with additional material. And as they begin to see and are exposed to other things, they will see the shallowness of the indoctrination. And they will rescue themselves. Thank you. Uh, you spoke of the uh, reimagining of the self. Mm -hmm. um, I in reference towards the end of your speech tonight, 
of the tearing down in society. Yes. And just now, as you referenced, and, and you had said about the freedom to to uh, provide for ourselves. Yes. So in this current society that we are on the age, that we are existing in, how do yes. we go about this finding of yes. the ability to be human? Uh, suffice to say, starting with the expression in the Declaration of Independence, the pursuit of happiness, uh, we've generally adopted a fairly libertarian view of that question, uh, which, which I'm summarizing to mean, and I'm not saying this as an aspersion upon any libertarian who's present, so don't think of it that way, but, but I'm summarizing it to mean that it is the pursuit and not the happiness that matters. <laughs> and that we're assuming that everybody is pursuing something that he or she regards as happy and that there's no substantive judgment to be made about what actually produces happiness. Well, this notion that we only have eccentric, subjective, individual desires that will make us happy is inconsistent with the true notion of happiness and certainly inconsistent with what was thought at the founding. And the essay to which the gentleman referred is one that cites John Adams, who identifies happiness as moral performance, a performance of excellence and in conformity with moral principles. Human beings are actually specific kinds of beings. They're not blank slates that can be any and everything. And this whole idea of making yourself whatever you choose to be, and if there being no limit to what you might choose, well, this is a complete corruption and perversion. We, we are, in fact, not unlimited. We have functions as human beings, and discovering those functions and performing them with excellence is what our task is in this world. So, so that when we speak of happiness at the founding, and, and, we, and it's before the Declaration of Independence. It's not Thomas Jefferson. In fact, it's John Adams who is the most articulate on this question in his thoughts concerning government. We're actually talking about people taking on the responsibility of being human, not the responsibility of an identity, but being the kind of being that we are. And in that sense, it's perfectly compatible with what Aristotle taught about human nature. One would say, um, you might even grant that it's a pity, but the old idea of freedom as productive agency, <clears throat> equal opportunity, I understand that which sense, had run its course and the conditions of an industrial society and whatever no longer uh, allowed for the efficacy of the older ethic. Well, I have a wonderful question because, of course, that's the whole burden of the Commonwealth Club address that Roosevelt made already in 32, and we've seen it repeated many times since then. They're saying the whole world is gone and nobody can yes, make it. Yes, I have a very simple answer to that very important question, but a very difficult one. I will quote Nancy Reagan. Just say no. We have to redevelop the habit of saying no to the state, no to the government. Say, mother, I'd rather do it myself. Leave me alone. I'll take care of it. Get out of my city. Get out of my school. Get out of my hair. Just say no. That's where it begins. Are there enough decent humans to do that? <laughs> yes, as long as they see the example around them. <laughs> Well, what they were talking about was the consequences of the community not discovering more and more natural resources. The natural resources are by definition finite, the universe is by definition finite. That's it. But the human intelligence is not finite. And we can turn whatever there is to our purposes through our agency. That's the difference. So those who speak of the closing of the frontier are actually trying to close off human.
opportunities in some instances in life where yes. nobody leaves the same. So uh, I've had one of those, and I think many of us can testify to that. So thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. We hope to see you at another uh, event. Thank you. course that's the whole burden of the Commonwealth Club address that Roosevelt made already in 32 and we've seen it repeated many times since then they're saying the old world is gone and nobody can make it on his own any longer you can't go out and turn a plot of land there's no plot of land to be had you can't build any new railroads you can't do this you can't do that except of course we've lived through what an era in which people have found extraordinary ways to gain wealth <laughs> that didn't exist previously which meant that there was a premature closing of the frontier because of a closing of mind about what the frontier meant. The frontier wasn't a geographical boundary. The frontier has never been a geographical boundary. The frontier is human inventiveness. And that doesn't close ever. And when we expect an infinite expansion of wealth, as they did in the founding era, Hamilton explained it very well in the 11th Federalist Papers, but all of them depended on this argument. What they were talking about was the consequences of human inventiveness, not discovering more and more natural resources. The natural resources are by definition finite. The universe is by definition finite in that sense. But the human inventiveness is not finite. And we can turn whatever there is to our purposes through our agency. That's the difference. So those who speak of the closing of the frontier are actually trying to close off human agency. Thank you. <laughs>